Anne-Marie and, Anne and I are the kind of people who look at history books and read them backwards, look goes to the sources and see if we know anyone in the acknowledgements. Um, when we see photos and overheads, we wonder, oh, which collection was that from? And um, on that point, I assume the curtain letter is the one on the, the uh, program cover, Anne-Marie? Yes? Okay, right. Um, three preliminary points. The first is to disabuse you that, uh, of any thought that this paper is based on deep research on Bean. Uh, they're more reflections and suggestions um, looking at the sources that people use to undertake Bean studies. Um, secondly, this perhaps odd phrase, the Bean Distributed Archive. Um, Underpinning that are three ideas. The first really is an Australian idea that was around in the library world in the 1990s when people talked about the distributed national collection, a kind of a concept of the sum of the parts alluding to national documentation strategies and so on. Um, another influence is the Canadian idea personified by Libraries Archives Canada of total archives where one eschews distinctions between government archives and the papers of people and organisations that you might see in Australia more collected by the National Library as opposed to the National Archives. Um, the Canadians were also very big in this total archives concept of also being quite Catholic in the documentation they pursued. Um, there's the, the, a bias towards written over AV was certainly not um, th their priority. And that also, the, the idea of total archive sits behind the Bean distributed archive. And thirdly, there's a, a, a growing change within the archival world where the concept of provenance, um, which once focused on a single creator, a person or an agency of a particular series of records, has given way to a richer, broader concept of provenance where people now talk about multiple provenance. They talk about the co-creation of a file that acknowledges the subject of a file has as much right uh, to be acknowledged as the creator of the file. So all these things feed into this perhaps unusual phrase of the distributed Bean archive. So by the distributed Bean archive, I mean the principal collections obviously, so named and identified, held in public institutions and preeminently the War Memorial. Plus all the Bean originated documents especially letters he wrote, residing in other public collections. Now, if any of you know anything about Bean, you know he was, he was a, a constant letter writer. Where are those letters? Well, obviously, if he kept copies, and he often did, they'd be at the War Memorial. But think of the thousands of recipients of Bean letters around the world. They are in the distributed Bean Archive. And all of the documents about Bean, not by Bean, about Bean in public collections around the world. There's, you just, just think about that. Think of examples. And finally, the distributed Bean Archive includes all the material of these three kinds still held privately. My third preliminary is to respond to the brilliant idea of the conference organisers to have an actual session on being as creator, creator of records, compiler, creator, creator of organisations that in turn create records. I've encountered some very large personal collections in my career 
and the obsessive magpies that sit behind them. Percy Granger and Sir John Ferguson stand out, but Bean is in the league of his own. Have you ever encountered a more driven and relentless documenter? Citizen archivist, auto archivist, way ahead of his time in appreciating the importance of audiovisual, artistic and oral history documentation. Someone who practiced locks long before internet archivists realized lots of copies keep stuff safe. He was a fossicker from a young age and had a diary keeping mother as an example. He saw very early the documentary needs of his journalist and historian roles and later of the memorial's memorialising role. You can't have a role of honour unless you get the information, create the records. And he did something about it. A quick digression. My first boss at the Woomera was a man called Max Strahm. He, he's, he's still greatly fixed in my mind. Morning tea was a black coffee, a quick ease and a cigarette. And he used to, uh, Peter will know this better than I, he used, Max had obsessions and he'd rant and take another quick ease. <laughs> and he used to say, ideas are cheap the prize goes to the person who gets it implemented. They're not always the same person. And when you think of the accumulating material as the years ticked by, it must have taken being careful thought an organisation to ensure, despite all the travel and all the moving houses, think of Bean's life and all of those moves, to ensure that his papers were secure, just to maintain the safety of his diaries and notebooks during the war was an achievement. Some had to be retrieved under mud. Doubly so in safely bringing every one of them back to Australia. Like Granger and his museum at the University of Melbourne, and like Ferguson and the National Library, Bean deprivatised his storage worries as soon as he could. His first donation to the memorial was 1922, even before it was the memorial. Okay. The point of my paper flows from this question. Why on earth would anyone planning to undertake a study of Bean or of an aspect of Bean's life or of an event or issue that involved Bean need to go anywhere other than the War Memorial. Just think of a moment, for the moment, what is there? Bean's own papers, including all of the war correspondent and war history documentation, copies of numerous outletters and so on, and extensive documentation of Bean's extended family. What riches? The significance of just the diaries and notebooks are beyond, are beyond dispute. And why they are not on the UNESCO Australian Memory of the World Register <coughs> is puzzling, especially as the library's copy of the Murdoch letter and the Mitchell Library's First World War personal diaries collections are. But I digress. Apart from the memorials being collections just mentioned, there, are, there is so much complementary material. Various military history archives and the papers of other official historians, of Basley, of the photographers and artists, cameramen, of the participants in the actions he describes, of the Australian War Record section. I'm already getting tired of this list. It goes on and on. Sets of Bean's published writing and so much secondary material, including a wonderful set of unit histories. In effect, one could say that operating inside the memorial is a Bean autobiographical archive, like the Bob Hawke Prime Ministerial Library or the Granger Museum. Bean is everywhere. He is honoured and described without qualification 
as the War Memorial's founder. The Memorial has republished his books, produced guides to his papers and facilitated access to them early. Named a building after him, established a Bean Scholarship, digitised his diaries and notebooks and supported many editions of the Gallipoli Diaries, cooperated closely with the C.W. Bean Foundation and replaced the Pericles funeral oration with one of Bean's own. The current director can't begin a speech without mentioning him. The memorial doubles as a Bean Museum, like the Granger Museum. If you disagree, I hope you'll follow the point I'm going to make. If you disagree, explain why the memorial isn't pestering Bob O'Neill or Peter Edwards for letters to and from their partners and families not planning to set up an exhibit of their studies. Just be. Let me ask again, why would anyone need to go anywhere else other than the War Memorial? Answer, because not everything is there. And that matters. And it should be remedied. If we can imagine a totality of extant bean sources and with the main concentration at the War Memorial, the remainder is a tale of long, if indeterminate length. But is that concentration alone precisely known? I feel certain even at the War Memorial, not all bean material has been identified. Its online guides to the main bean collections, AWM 38 and PR 283, try to be helpful in pointing to other bean accessions. But that's it. A researcher who suspects there is bean material in the Basley, Birdwood, Elliot, Gellibrand, Long, Pierce and White collections would be proved right if they checked the relevant online catalogues. The only barriers to doubling or trebling that number are time, imagination, the quality of the memorial's finding aids and the knowledge of the research centre's current bean expert. Then, remaining in Canberra, there are other library and archive collections, as we know. Clearly at the NAAs, and Marie has demonstrated, there are good sources on the War Archives and Commonwealth Archives Committees, and therefore been. But in addition, I'm sure you've all done this, keying Bean's name into the archives online catalogue record search generates dozens of results, most of which have been examined and cleared for public access. And that's only the little bit, the minority, of the 270 kilometres of records controlled by the archives classified as national archives. And remember, war, the history, and the war memorial involved governments, hence documentation. The National Library, there are letters by and or material about Bean in a surprisingly large number of manuscript collections. Based purely on searching its online catalogue and online finding aids, my preliminary list is as follows. As a little test, see as I mention the names, you can go, ah, Bean, nature of relationship. Here we go. Henry Boot. John Barrett, Manning Clark, already mentioned, C.S. Daly, Robert Garron, Bill Gamage, Ken Inglis, T. Inglis Moore, John Lanose, John Latham, Dudley McCarthy, Angus McLaughlin, John Monash, Keith Murdoch, Wilfred Kent Hughes, H.M. Green, George Pierce, Ernest Scott, J.H. Scullin, I'm getting tired, H.L. White, Chester Wilmot, Lionel Wigmore, and Brudenell White. All have been material in them, mostly letters. There is almost certainly more. 
Rather than subject you to another list, I'll just say that I have confirmed there is also relevant bean material, primarily correspondence at the ANU archives, the ACT archives, the University of Melbourne archives, Charles Sturt University archives, State Library of Victoria, and the Tasmanian Archive and Heritage Office. Sorry, one more list. State Library of New South Wales. Try and do the same as with the National Library. There have been letters or other documentation in the papers of W.H. Hyman, John Herbert Butler, John Ferguson, George Lambert, A.H. Chisholm, Sir David Ferguson, and the Worth family. And in the records of, pretty obviously, Angus and Robertson, the Parks and Playgrounds movement, and the World Disarmament movement. Then there are overseas libraries and archives, which we'll note without delay. It is a certain fact there has been material worth locating. To his credit, Peter Rees made good use of bean letters in the Little Heart Centre, and the archivist at Brentwood School and Clifton College must by now have a permanent <laughs> fact sheet pre-packaged for the next inquiry from Australia. But there is much more as five minutes searching on the National Archives equivalent to Trove called Discovery will prove. You would think by now all extant bean material is in public institutions, but we know from the Coltart and Rees biographies there is bean material and Basley material still in private hands. Historians and biographers often locate material in this way. Michael McKernan benefited similarly from the family of John Trelaw when writing the memorial's history 25 years ago. It's partly why authors' own papers are so desired by libraries and archives. It's partly why you'll find at the National Library the papers of David Marr, John Lanose, Geoffrey Searle, Don Watson, Laurie Fitzharding, John Mulvaney and Alan Martin, all of them authors of fine biographies. Their publications too can prompt the discovery of further material as happened when David Marr published his edition of Patrick White Letters. Let's recap. The memorials collections aside, there is an unknown quantity of other bean material out there and simple searching of online catalogues gives us an inkling of where and what. It's a paradox often observed that the seeming exhaustiveness of a single institution's vast holdings discourages inquiry elsewhere. Deadlines have the same result. Does this matter? Because new material can yield new information, new questions and new insights, yes it does. Bean's official history volumes offer a perfect case in point. The third edition of volume one, which came out in 1934, has 20 pages of additions and corrections based on new material, enemy and allied, new publications, new participant testimony. Closer to home, think of the fresh angles on just a few years of Bean's life, which were revealed when Justice Geoffrey Lindsay in 2011 considered Bean as a barrister, judge's associate, and what he called moral philosopher, and used Bean abused material never thought of before as Bean sources. Look what Michael McKernan did last year at the National Archives when for a Remembrance Day address, he researched Bean's repatriation files. And of course, there must be more. There's bound to be. What fresh insights await a Bean researcher looking at the 1914 committee minutes and papers of deposits, hope you're writing this down, 
Z270 and N59 of the Australian Journalists Association. Held, do we know where they're held? At the ANU Noel Butlin Archive Centre. And incidentally, how many votes did Bean win by exactly? I've read about, go for it, one? And we know that because? Okay, I've read about four people who say it was very close. You know it's one. I want to know how we know that. I'm not, I'm not picking on you, Martin. Anyway, what fresh insight might we gain from looking at the Tasmanian Archive and Heritage Office collection of Ida Sowerby Macaulay, who once worked for and was related to Bean? What gold resides in the Federal Capital Commission file held in the ACT archives on Tuggeranong, leased by Defence for the official history team? It includes a brief history of the homestead by Bean, couldn't help himself. Goes to the Tuggeranong to write a history and court Effie, and he's researching the history of the, anyway. And far better identified on this file than the photocopy of these, this four page history in the National Library. It, this is the ACT archives Tuggeranong file, also suggests, how am I going? Oh, six it also suggests an alternative to the widely held view that he moved to Sydney because Tuggeranong was too cold. I've read five different statements, published statements, that Bean moved because Canberra was too cold. Perhaps that's true. Where's the evidence? It's clear, I hope, what needs to be done. With the recent biographies, Trove, growing online accessibility to finding aids, and continued strong public interest in Bean, two pieces of research infrastructure are now warranted. The compilation of a guide which identifies and briefly describes all extant bean related documents, regardless of location. And the compilation of a bibliography of all beans published work in the press, in service and other journals, as letters to the editor and so on. The bibliography project should be self-explanatory. The writings are in many ways themselves primary sources. The last Bean bibliography attempted was by Alan Ives in 1978, and he rightly subtitled it a, towards a bibliography and published it, and also did Gavin Long at the same time. 1978. As for the guide to documents, there are models to emulate in both process and output. Definitely worth looking at are the person-focused research guides that the NAA produces, the latest being on Gough Whitlam. Came out, Anne-Marie, a couple of weeks ago. Okay. Gough Whitlam. It's also online. Gough Whitlam, C.W. Bean. It lists material in all the obvious places, National Library, National Archives, Whitlam Institute, and many others besides, complemented on the NAA's Prime Minister's website by a, a world map with scattered with little red dots. Such guides cut horizontally through the vertical finding aids, vertical listings of record series of personal papers, looking for any file or folder of material created by their person of interest or compiled about him or her. That's what Maggie Shapley and I did in 2011 when we compiled Prime Ministers at the ANU, an archival guide. 
There is not one collection of a Prime Minister at the ANU archives, including Noel Butler, not one. And yet, we produced an entire book on material about Prime Ministers in non-Prime Ministers collections. We weren't searching the world, we were just searching the ANU. The most numerous of these location and description projects seek out for publication the letters of a renowned figure scattered around the world. In Australia, there was an initiative begun in 1987 by Rod Holm and the Royal Botanic Gardens, Melbourne, to track down 10,000 or so von Mueller letters. More recent is David Marr's pursuit of letters by Patrick White. There are numerous and much bigger operations from the UK and North America, T.S. Eliot, um, this Carlisle, Henry James, led by university presses usually, or an equivalent research centre. As part of a Bean Guide project, I think efforts should be made to locate all relevant material, including material held privately. In addition, we need a new overview to all of the memorial's bean accessions and of its non-bean accessions, which include bean and bean-related documents. Obviously, the memorial should be the most important stakeholder for these projects. And I hope all the War Memorial people here are taking note. The leadership mantle of National Centre of Excellence in Bean Studies is there if it wants it. And if it truly does think Bean is so, so special. Others with likely interest in the guide and bibliography would include Usual Suspects, NAA, NLA, the CEW Bean Foundation, UNSW, Canberra even, Tom and perhaps the National Centre of Biography at the ANU. Until then, the distributed Bean archive remains bigger than we'll ever know. Thank you. So interested in that, I forgot to turn the microphone off. Yeah. Thanks, Andrew. Questions for Michael. Wealth of experience and knowledge. Oh, uh, there, Chris. Chris, do you know how many votes Bean beat Murdoch by? No, I'm very much, very much uh, an interested observer. But look, thank you for that really interesting talk. Yeah. It's obviously a subject not for the faint-hearted, given the uh, the riches involved. But I thought your contrast with Percy Granger was really interesting because I don't know if anyone else saw it, but Percy, there was a, uh, an exhibition of Percy Granger stuff at the National Library when they were renovating the museum in Melbourne. Indeed. And he was a person who thought it was worthwhile um, showing his dental records, I think there was a tram ticket somewhere. So he had yeah. this idea that people would be interested in this stuff. Yes. And I'm wondering, did Bean have a sense that he would be of interest to huh. later generations? Did he in some way want to shape the memory that people might have of him? Well, you'd think the answer was yes, wouldn't you? <laughs> and that's why it's a good question. Biographers would have a much better chance of answering that than I would, but I want to say no, I th but I'm, I'm truly, you, you've cast doubt in my mind. The, the drive to document as a journalist and then as the proto-historian and then the, and setting up organisations to continue that work, we get that and it makes sense. But as I said, from a very young age, Bean had, I mean, th there's literature now on the auto-archivist impulse, and he, I think he had it. But it's not, we, we're going to drift into any second now, why do people take selfies? Um, <laughs> the, you, you really ask me, look, I don't know, but it wasn't just um, what's the word logical or it, it wasn't it wasn't it was inherent yes and it wasn't just f 
for an end. But I mean, he did. He, I'm really pleased that you have followed my. Can we ask Peter Rees to comment? Ask Peter Rees to comment. Peter, do you want to be dubbed in? Um, I was going to go to some of this uh, in my talk later this afternoon. But, okay. Uh, um, right from a very early age, Bean was a collector. Um, he collected, he kept um, uh, the drawings from school. Mm. Um, I, it was innate in him. Uh, it was also part of uh, his upbringing and the, uh, the uh, well, uh, I'll, I'll re refer to what I'm, uh, in, in, in uh, passing to what I'm going to say this afternoon, part, um, in part it was largely due to uh, uh, the Arnold tradition um, under which he was brought up both uh, by his, uh, uh, his family at home, his father, the uh, headmaster, and also at school. Um, he had this commitment to, to uh, uh, public duty, to not furthering himself per se, but by doing things that were in the public interest. There was a commitment to duty, and I think collecting material was, was, uh, was part and parcel of this. But I'll say, I'll say more on this this afternoon. Okay. Thank you. More questions? Okay. Martin. Ah. <laughs> I'm fascinated by this. Wait, 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 wait. For, the, for the sake can't of the record. Talk. I can't talk. <laughs> I'm fascinated by what you have to say, Michael. It's really um, very, very interesting. My own work on the last paragraph, in fact, began yeah. in the distributed archive, um, sparked by a chance article by Anthony Barker, where he'd come across some papers in the Mitchell Library. Uh -huh. um, and, yeah. uh, and from that, I thought, oh, there must be something that warm about too, and it took me, it was really just days and days of going through things and stumbling finally upon um, yeah. a, a sheaf of papers which at the time I, I'm, sure, I'm sure no one had ever read since um, being put them in. But th that, that's a very important point that you make, that there are things everywhere just waiting to be found. I would say that um, there can be a danger, as, as you alluded, about putting everything in one place because mm. that's the only place that people will then go. Yeah. Uh, whereas a lot of the very interesting things happen because of researchers who are looking for something else yeah. uh, and come across, come across yeah. something which then sparks um, yes. this um, unexpected connection. Yeah. Two quick responses. Granger set up a second museum, as Chris may know, um, in New York. Um, but, but, but let's stay with let's stay with the institution that, for historic reasons, claims the game, as it were. It says we are we we have the bean papers. We are the the centre of concentration. And and now shift for a second. The Scott Polar Institute of Arctic Antarctic Research. Okay, if you if you are internationally known as this is where most of the stuff is. I think there's an opportunity and almost an obligation to say, right, we are now going to, we are now going to be the world experts on this person and this per material on this person. Continue what being started. Publish a guide, an online guide, digitise, and then say, "Now, hmm, I wonder what else is out there." I, d does no? I'll, I'll stop there. <clears throat> Easy for me to say this, but the the memorial rightly does say, "Bean is so so special, and we are the centre of Bean." The, the paragraph where I said, look, all of these things, been, 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 scholarships, buildings, quotes, publications, republications, Kevin Fuster's book, three times published, a new wonderful book on the Gallipoli mission, been, 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 okay. Here's the agenda. Because as Peter, I'm sure, will confirm, we've barely started on been. Anne-Marie and I joked the other day about a book of biographical chapters on Bean 
that doesn't go anywhere near First World War and all of the post First World War flow ons, museum, history, blah, blah, blah. A non war bean. You could fill a book, at least one. I better stop. Two and a half minutes. Last question. Or last comment. Or if you believe enough to disagree with Mike. More lunch. Ah, oh, gosh. Gosh. Um, I'll strap myself in again. I have a question there, Michael, that around the traps, the memorial often is accused of being not the Australian War Memorial, but the Australian First World War Memorial. Um, yes. We're in an age where national institutions are facing cutbacks, efficiency dividends, all that sort of stuff. We have an Australian experience of war that runs from potentially pre-Federation through until recent conflicts in Afghanistan. Yeah. Um, how much been is too much been? Um, <laughs> sure, even in a time of limited resources, should perhaps the memorial be focusing on uh, other official historians or, you know, where... Yeah, it's, I mean, the, the, the question just is begged by the concentration of the program for this conference. One day on Bean, one day on the rest. Um, but the, just there's so much in the question. Um, it doesn't all have to be the War Memorial. I did list some stakeholders. Um, many people would join. A, a, a consortium self-suggests to if... If there's a hundred thousand dollars for for the CW Bean War Correspondence um, Memorial at the War Memorial, um, it it I had to use the word linkage grant, but I mean there, there I am sure if one had the vision and the drive and you know qualities of a certain former war historian, it it could could be made to happen, and it shouldn't. I know budgets forced choices, but it shouldn't be one or the other. I, I can't wait to read a big biography of Kevin Long, for starters. But I'm not sure I've answered your question, but um, it's not... In what I've proposed, it's not just the memorial. It's the memorial taking the lead and getting others involved. Kerry Stokes would be up for it, I'm sure. I will stop now. Thanks, Sam.